Hi everyone, how are you? Today we're gonna be live talking about fertility, that this is an issue that impacts so many of us. So we're gonna be talking to Britt Anderson, she's a nurse practitioner and a doula, and she's gonna be talking to us about lifestyle things that impact our fertility, some of the things that we can do to improve our egg quality, some of the things that we can do to actually improve our chances of getting pregnant, what type of tests you can do. We're gonna be talking about so many things today, so I'm super excited for Brit to join us. And you guys that are joining right now live, I would love to know if you are having any issues with fertility. Uh, when we were talking on stories yesterday, we got a lot of questions about how to improve egg quality because a lot of you guys were wanting either to get pregnant for the first time or pregnant for the, the second time, how to improve your chances of an egg retrieval. You guys had so many questions that we got yesterday, so you can start putting them on the question box below. And once Brit joins us, we'll start talking about all of those topics. like. I can see um, a lot of questions are coming in right now, um, but we're gonna get started. So as soon as Brie joins us, but we'd love to get your questions. Um, I have PCOS and I've been trying for about six months with no success, that's perfect. We can talk about PCOS. We are gonna be talking about how hormones relate to your fertility as well. Um, Brie really helps moms on a daily basis with this. So we're gonna be talking about that right now. And I would love to know, is anybody else, are you guys here like trying for a first baby, for a second baby? Um, I would love to know. And also like we do on each one of our lives. Um, if you wanna try any of our Mashka products, please put it in the comments along with your questions. And we'll pick a bunch of you guys to try some of our products, depending on what product you wanna try. We'll pick you guys. Britt, I saw that you joined our live. So if you can request to join the live, that would be perfect. Um, so let's get started and let me just put it here, um, right here, um, uh, as again, we're just, um, we're just going to wait for Brit to ask, um, Brit, if you're having any issues with connecting, please let me know, but I see you here on the live. So if you can just request to join, um, that would be perfect. And like I said, would love to hear from you guys that are live. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're experiencing with fertility? If you are trying to conceive your first baby, second baby, having any questions about treatments, how to optimize your body, anything that you guys have questions on, we'll get into that um, right now. So let me see uh, here. I don't know if Brit is having any questions, any issues to... I'm here. Britt says she's here. She's just having trouble requesting to join, guys. So thank you so much for your patience. Um, Britt, you just have to add here. Let me see if I can add you, but I can't add you myself. You have to request um, to join. Uh, perfect. So she's here. Sorry, guys. While, um, while Britt joins us, um, would love to know if any of you want to try any of our Mashka products and what product that would be because to thank you for your patience, I would be like, we can send you a code to you to get one of the products that you want to try. So if you haven't tried our hydration booster that I have here that I add to my water every day, it's great for every stage from pregnancy to breastfeeding. Behind there, you can see our chocolate oats, our protein powders, our lactation booster. So if there's any product that you've been curious about and you haven't tried, please put it here in the comments and I will make sure you get a code so you can get to try it for free, okay? And then Brit is just um, trying to join us right now. So we're just gonna wait. Like I said, we're gonna be talking about fertility today. Um, we are going to be talking about what factors affect our fertility. Um, what things we can do to support our hormones and how our hormones related to fertility, what things can we do with nutrition to optimize our fertility. So it's going to be a really interesting live. Um, there is no option. Um, Britt, I can't invite you. Um, you actually have to request to join. So let me see. Oh, I can request. Let me see. I'm going to try to invite Britt. Uh, here so you hopefully can see my request um, 
Here she comes. Hey, Brave, how are you? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I, we can hear you perfectly fine. Okay, I'm so sorry. Yeah, there was no option for me to request, which I've not seen before. And I'm like, I've done this before. I know that I can figure this out. I know, no, no problem. We're just gonna get started right in it. I, like, I was seeing some questions already, um, already kind of like showing up. So I wanted to get started with, so we can get right into it about, I feel like so much more now we're seeing issues with fertility, right? Like my mom always says like, oh, when I was young, like I didn't have as many friends like struggling with fertility. I didn't hear it as a, such a common issue. But what are some of like the lifestyle factors or that you are seeing that are impacting our fertility? Uh, gosh, there's so many things. I think that for this group in particular, y'all probably know that our toxic load is just crazy. The things that we're exposed to, particularly things that disrupt our uh, our hormones. So endocrine disruptors, right? So plastics, the BPA and plastics, all the things in our personal care products, the things that are used to make furniture. I mean, it's just everywhere. I think that's a big part of it. And, you know, I, I was listening to this really great masterclass from a friend of mine last week, and she was just talking about, you know, our biology is still very primal and we haven't really evolved to be able to handle just the influx of things that are thrown at us, whether that are these, um, that's this chemical stress or the lifestyle that so many of us live. I mean, we just are living kind of at odds with our biology. So that's a big piece of it, I think. I agree. So like our stress, the chemicals that are around us, mm -hmm. like what are some of the things that are actually in our hands when it comes to our lifestyle? Because some things we can't control, right? Sometimes we're exposed to things that we can't really control. Like if we go somewhere and I don't know, like I'm just gonna make this up, I don't even know if it affects us, but the Wi-Fi, right? Everybody's talking right now about how Wi-Fi affects yeah. the yeah. EMS. But there are things that you can't necessarily control when you're traveling, you're exposed to so many things. <clears throat> but what are some of the things that we actually do have control of in our daily life that actually have an impact in our fertility? Yeah, so um, just with the Wi-Fi really quickly, you know, at home, do your best to keep your phone on airplane mode. And then you can actually, I have my Wi-Fi router on a timer. So it's on a Christmas like tree light timer and um, it goes off at night. So it shuts off all night long so that me and my kids and my husband and dogs and everyone in the house is not getting exposure 24 seven because you know, I know this is a part of our life. We need this, this is how I run my business. Like I get it, but we can give ourselves these little breaks. Aside from that, the thing that is so interesting to me is uh, women come to me and they want these very extensive detox programs and they want all the supplements and like all these crazy fancy things, which mm -hmm. we can totally do, but it has to come down to the basics first. We have to yes. set this solid foundation, right? So things exactly. you can control, you can control shutting off your screen 30 minutes before bed and really having a good solid bedtime routine you can control getting up in the morning and getting sunlight on your face while you're drinking your coffee i'm not going to take your coffee away from you mm -hmm. um, you can control the foods that you're putting in your body you can control uh, the amount of media that you're consuming because that can be incredibly stressful especially over the last few years we've seen like just the divisiveness that we're exposed to like that really plays into our stress level so those are really simple things you can control and people get so frustrated with me because like we got to get the basics first before we do all these other more complex expensive things and some of those basics like how are they related to our fertility so like for example when you're talking about sleep like improving your sleep mm -hmm. not exposing yourself to like crazy toxic media and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. is it all related to stress like are we trying to kind of like control stress because stress has a high impact on kind of like our ability to conceive or like those basics, mm -hmm. like what are they targeting? Yeah, so our nervous system for sure. Mm -hmm. So we really have to remember that when we are in this sympathetic state, that fight or flight state, our body is prioritizing keeping us alive. So yeah. if it's trying to run away from the bear that's chasing you or the super stressful job or whatever it is, it's not going to prioritize fertility. Fertility is really only something that can take place when we're in a state of safety in that parasympathetic response. So mm -hmm. yes, all of these things and you know, stress on the body could be an underlying infection for sure, but a lot of times it is, um, you know, the, the way that we're not getting enough sleep, we're not recovering, we're not eating well, we're not, um, 
saying no to things. Women are really bad about saying no and they do way too many things and put too much on their plate. Um, all of those things really play into nervous system dysregulation. So that's actually the place where I usually start because it's really hard to implement any kind of lifestyle changes um, if we have a dysregulated nervous system. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I'm just starting with the basics, but I feel like we live in a world right now where we want the magic pill, right? We want a pill for everything. We want everything like to be solved in 24 hours. But yeah. I love that you're saying that, that the first you start with the basics, your body is really hard for your body to get pregnant. If it's prioritizing, it's feeling it's like in survival mode, right? So it doesn't yes. feel kind of like at peace. So starting by trying to balance mm -hmm. your nervous system seems like the way to go. And then I want to ask you something super important too. I feel like every time I hear talks about fertility and everything like that, their hormones come up, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's always the talk of hormones, like, oh, you need to balance your hormones. I feel like that's the number one thing I hear, like, but what hormones, like, what hormones are we talking about when it comes to fertility? Like, what are we trying to balance here? What hormones actually play a role? And tell us a little bit about that, because I feel like it's a really confusing conversation and it's very generalized. Yeah to the sense that balance your hormones. Yeah, well, it still comes back to the nervous system, right? Because the hypothalamus is sort of the, we call it the master conductor of the nervous system. And it's what's talking to the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is gonna talk to the thyroid and to the ovaries. And so, Again, if we're in this heightened stress state, we are pumping out lots of cortisol, which we need cortisol. Cortisol is a super important mm -hmm. hormone for immune function. It's supposed to follow a circadian rhythm. So it should be high in the morning, about an hour-ish after waking, and then it's going to decrease throughout the day. And oftentimes what we'll see is this dysregulated pattern where maybe it's like super low in the morning, and then we get this like spike mid-morning after we've downed a bunch of coffee, and then we have this drop again, and then we have a big spike at night. So that's a dysregulated pattern and that's going to play into the function of all our other hormones. So, you know, balance your hormones is tricky because there's so many hormones to focus on. Exactly. But what I very commonly see um, is that blood sugar is playing a really big mm -hmm. um a really big part in fertility challenges. So that's one of the things I'm looking at. I'm looking at the blood sugar response and insulin. So if we're pumping out a bunch of insulin, that can actually cause some fertility challenges. And what women don't realize is that we have to be eating enough. We have to be eating enough protein. Um, when we go too long between meals, that is stressful on the nervous system. And then when we finally eat, we get this huge blood sugar response and sugar is toxic. In our when it's in our bloodstream we need to get it into the cells where it can be used for energy and so we have to put out a bunch of insulin then to bring that blood sugar into the cells and get it out of get it out of the blood um and so insulin can can really be disruptive in that way that can be like a whole inflammatory cascade that can actually cause disruptions and ovulation so there's a lot of different um avenues we have to go down but that's one of the first ones i'm looking at i also see a lot of thyroid issues we know that thyroid yes. issues are really underdiagnosed Rampage. and yes and you can absolutely have like subclinical hypothyroidism you know the the range of normal for um for thyroid for tsh which is the hormone mm -hmm. that we normally look at you know tsh is not a thyroid hormone it's the hormone that tells your thyroid to make thyroid hormone and the range for normal is huge so up to four is considered normal after that you're considered having slow thought like a slow thyroid so hypothyroidism but you don't want it to be above 2.5 for pregnancy so riddle me that how is it normal to have it up to four but it has to be below 2.5 for pregnancy that makes no sense no when sense. you're thinking about fertility right so optimally it's between one and two um and so that is a big piece that i see and that doesn't mean you have to go on a thyroid medication but that is letting us know okay maybe there is some stressor in your environment maybe a toxic stressor like fluoride in your water that's causing that thyroid to not work as efficiently as it could maybe it is you're not sleeping well maybe it is that we've got that circadian rhythm dysfunction because you're going to bed at midnight and and you're not getting up with the sun and getting that sunlight on your face. So there's all these little pieces um, that we have to look at in order to really get to the bottom of what's going on with, um, with hormones. The ones that I think people tend to look at are estrogen yes. and progesterone, right? 
Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Um, but estrogen is, you know, the hormone that builds things. It's what gives us our womanly shape and our breasts mm -hmm. and it builds up the uterine lining so that we can sustain a pregnancy. And then progesterone is like the stabilizer. That is what is produced after ovulation. Uh, and so I, I often see both of those low in women are very, very recently. I've been seeing a lot of women with low estrogen and normal progesterone. So they're clearly ovulating, but because they're not building up a good, strong lining in their right. uterus, they're not able to sustain a pregnancy. And that can happen because of toxic load. Um, when your antioxidant stores are eaten up because you've got all of these toxins or you've been sick and your body's trying to fight off a lot, your estrogen can be low. Um, I also see that a lot with women who are over exercising and maybe their body fat percentage is quite low. Um, you know, it's so individualized. Some women can get pregnant just fine with a super low body fat percentage, but others need to have a little bit more fat on their body in order to sustain a pregnancy. And so I don't like to make general statements, but that's just kind of something that we'll see. And so sometimes it really is like, we got to get more fat into your body. Um, and a lot of times I'm checking cholesterol levels because cholesterol mm -hmm. is the precursor to all of our hormones. And a lot of times women have low, low cholesterol, especially women who um, are really trying to focus on it, like a plant-based diet and not eating a lot of animal products. That's something that I'll commonly see. And then we can have ovulation problems for whatever reason. Ovulation can be delayed because of stress. Um, and we need ovulation in order to get that progesterone level up. So there's lots of things we can do, but I think so much focus gets put on estrogen and progesterone, and it's just way more complex than that, as you can probably tell from, from me saying all this. Exactly. And I feel like you've said some really important things. It's like so multifactorial, right? Yeah. So yeah. I love like how we've been talking about this approach of like starting with one thing at a time, right? Starting with the basics, like starting to get your nervous system under control, those cortisol levels, that stress, like getting in your sleep, like trying to get your body in a sense of peace or like calm a little bit. Yeah. And then all of these things that you're talking about, like we always talk, like you said, about estrogen and progesterone, right? Like that's what we hear a lot as women, mm -hmm. not just in fertility, but like in menopause, like all through our yes. life. Yes. But hey, like what about the part that like more than 80% of the people in our country are, have issues metabolically, right? So insulin, right. not a lot right. of That's huge. Those that's things, huge mm -hmm. right so we have people or i have friends that are going through this crazy treatments and they're like oh it's your estrogen but your progesterone but nobody has mentioned to, like them like hey like have you ever like measured your insulin Cortisol like and my, insulin, might, you yeah. have, might you have insulin resistance because mm -hmm. those are things that could be like should be i i think in my opinion tried and checked before you go through like extensive like treatments that put your body through so much right so I think yeah. like you've said some really empowering things of, like, hey, like, just like what's around you, like making sure that you're trying to like um, address the stress. Yes. But then also like, have you checked your thyroid? Are you working with a practitioner that actually understands um, mm -hmm. autoimmune disease? You know, like kind of like you were saying, it's not just the normal values, it's the optimal values. So right. thyroid, insulin yeah. resistance, like making sure that you have your diet on their control, um, super, super important. And you mentioned something important really as well that I don't think it's talked about a lot, which is your fat, your body percentage, right? Mm -hmm. As women, like, doesn't matter how we want to look, we are supposed to have like fat in our body, right? Yeah, like yeah. not extreme, not too little, but there is that sweet spot. So like looking into those things and saying like, okay, what is it, right? Before yeah. just blaming it on estrogen and progesterone, like what is mm -hmm. it that is going on? which brings me kind of like to the next topic. I saw someone, yeah. and I'm so sorry that it took so long to answer that question, but when we were having the issues with you joining, I saw somebody said, I have been trying for six months and I have uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what are some of the things that you see with PCOS and some of the things that she could do to try to help to conceive when she has PCOS? Yeah. So um, PCOS typically comes along with a little bit of that insulin resistance. And I want everyone to know, so PCOS is diagnosed based on like a variety of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So typically your androgen level, so like testosterone, DHEA will be a little bit elevated. We might see higher FSH and LH, which those are the yeah. hormones that help to mm -hmm. um, mature your follicles and then cause you to ovulate. So those can be a little bit out of whack. Um, and then sometimes on an ultrasound, we will see what's called a string of pearl. So multiple little follicles that have gotten um, larger, but like no one gets to be the dominant yeah. follicle. So all of these hormones are going up, but then we don't ovulate. And so we have these yeah. very long cycles. So what I want to say is that 
women are given this diagnosis very, very often when they're not having regular periods or they're having super long cycles without even like looking at other things. I just feel like we don't have enough names for the diagnoses. Now about 10, now about 10% of women do have PCOS, but again, I think we kind of just label it as that because we don't know what else to call it. Bottom line is I'm checking markers of insulin resistance on all of my patients, regardless of whether or not they have this diagnosis. So that's where I would start. And one of my favorite tools is a continuous glucose monitor. There are so many third party companies that you can get them through. Now you can ask your practitioner, your provider to write you a prescription. It's like $65 for just the little sensor. And then you can check your response to food and really hone in on your diet and see what works well. That's like my favorite tool. Um, We also know that inositol is incredibly beneficial. So inositol plus folate has been shown to be as effective as metformin, which is a medication given to diabetics to lower blood sugar. Yeah. So that combination has been shown to be just as effective as at helping to promote ovulation because it's normalizing that blood sugar. So there are so many supplements and, um, and herbal options. But I think, again, we have to start with that solid foundation. Like, are you keeping that blood sugar in check? Are you getting good sleep? What are you doing with your nervous system? Are you moving your body? Most of us are pretty sedentary. Even if we like go to the gym for an hour a day, if we spend the next 12 hours of the day sitting at a desk like this, that's considered sedentary. Um, someone, I, I saw the, a meme that was like, you're an active couch potato, which is true. Like you need to be moving like every hour for about 10 minutes. So that could even be standing up at your desk or sitting on the floor while you're working so that you're constantly having to change positions like we need to bring more movement um, and even that can help to support normal blood sugar because any movement that you do is increasing like your metabolic rate i love it and i think you said something all of the things you've said have been so actionable and so valuable but with pcos and insulin resistance like i it was my case mm-hmm. i was diagnosed with pcos when i was so young like 14 mm-hmm. which is crazy 14 or 13 like just very very young very painful periods, like all of these things and put on birth control for years, Mm -hmm. years and years. And then I had my struggles with fertility, but ultimately it came to my diet. Like I was able to reverse pretty much all the symptoms of PCOS when I got kind of like my diet under control. And when I worked with somebody like you that was able to like say like, Hey, like you don't have to be on birth control. Like these are all the things that we're going to check. We got cortisol Mm -hmm. under control. We got insulin under control and many other things that you normally don't think about insulin resistance in a 14 or 15 year old, you know, or things like that. Yeah. Right. Like it's just, we keep, that's one of the things that maybe with fertility, like we keep putting patches on the thing, but we never go to kind of like yeah. the root causes. So, and, and birth um, control is not, it's not a treatment. Birth exactly. control is not a treatment. And so then women are told, okay, it's fine. You're just going to be on the birth control pill to give you a period, which that's not a period. For 16 uh, years. Right. And then when right. you're ready to get pregnant, we're just going to give you this medication that's going to force your body to ovulate. Like that is crazy to me. Crazy. Exactly. Yeah. Crazy. And now, so we've talked about the kind of like the basics that we can do. We've talked a little bit about hormones, super important. You guys, if you're just doing uh, insulin resistance, making mm-hmm. sure, and then your thyroid. And I want to get into the next stage, which is, which is in our control as well, which is nutrition. Yes. So we live in a crazy world where we're all so busy, we're running all over the place, but what are some nutritional factors that can help us or like tips to improve our fertility or nutritional factors that actually affect our fertility? What are some of the things that you're looking at? Of course, you've already mentioned kind of like your glucose and making sure that yeah. probably like you're not like going like this all day, but yeah. are there any other things that we should consider? I know you briefly mentioned protein, so I don't know if yeah. we're both there. So oh, let's get into I, it. Yeah, that's like the hill I will die on. Um, so minimum of 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight a day is what I get everybody to start with. And then I, depending on how active you are, which I have like a lot of CrossFitters and a lot of really active mm-hmm. um, women in my care, like you're gonna need to work closer to one gram and maybe even higher of uh, protein per pound of body weight per day. That's a lot. And if you're not paying attention to it, it's really hard to hit that because, 
No, because protein's not, I mean, it's not the same as like grabbing a piece of toast. It's not super fun to have to choke down, you know, a chicken breast. It's a little more work, yes. but you've got to get into that habit. Um, that's huge because that is building healthy tissues. That increases your metabolism because it takes so much energy to burn through protein. It's important for detoxification, like all of the things. Um, super important once you do get pregnant. We know that pregnant women tend to really under eat protein as well. Um, and That's probably huge. women, just to make a point on protein, but probably majority of the women that you see, I can imagine, are eating probably less than 60, 70 grams. Oh, of yeah, if egg. that, if that. And then they're shocked. It's so helpful for them to finally, like, pay attention to it because they can't believe it. Um, and then, really, we have to really focus on whole foods. So I say like, if it comes in a package, probably avoid it unless it's got less than five ingredients. You know, if, if sugar, if cane sugar or corn syrup or any of that stuff is the second ingredient, it really shouldn't be in there at all. But if it's the second yeah. ingredient, you definitely throw it away. Like the um, Seriously. Um, <laughs> you know, we know that unfortunately the vast majority of American diets is these highly processed food like products. So they have like no nutrients in them. We've got to add nutrients back in because they're so highly processed. And then we're getting a lot of exposure to synthetic nutrients that don't necessarily do anything for us. Um, so really if we can eat foods in their most whole form and make that like 80% of our diet, that is going to be huge. Britt, here Tanya is asking, can you repeat how much protein you need? Yeah, so 0.8 grams per pound of body weight per day is a good starting point. And you guys, that is just so, we don't talk about it. I feel like there was this like fat revolution and like this like fiber and all of those things, but I think we don't talk about two of the most important things that Bridget just mentioned, which is eating whole foods, which is totally in our control yes. and eating a good amount of protein. Like not because you're eating healthy fats means you're not gonna eat protein. Like it's not one or the other. I feel like yeah. we've gotten a little bit lost in this diet conversation with like yes. keto, paleo, like all of those things and one or the other. And we've forgotten the basics of eating whole foods, number mm -hmm. one, and mm -hmm. getting good quality protein, staying the same, good quality fats and the right amount of carbs. Yeah. You know, I feel like that yes. is, we've gotten lost in like a big crazy conversation of yes. trends, I think. And and I think it's super important to your point. Like we also have to individualize. So even if you do paleo, mm -hmm. you can do paleo and and be spiking the crap out of your blood sugar. Exactly. Um, you know, I do not respond well to sweet potatoes. I was devastated to see what was happening to my blood sugar because I was eating a sweet potato for like as my carb for every meal and it was sending my blood sugar through the roof. So you have to really individualize it, whether you do keto or paleo or whole 30 or, you know, whatever. Um, I, I generally recommend eating some meat in your diet um, or some animal products in your diet, no matter what, but you've got to tailor it. And that's again, where um, really paying attention to your blood sugar can be super, super helpful so that you can still eat within that framework, but you've really been able to hone on in on the foods that work best for your body. I love it. So as far as nutrition, we said just to kind of like recap a little bit, making sure that you're not going like a roller coaster with your glucose. There mm -hmm. are glucose monitors that you actually now have. So there's a bunch of companies there. And then making sure that you're eating whole foods, making sure that you're hitting your protein goals. I think those are incredible. They're just three steps that you can take that you could see a huge impact. And not just in your fertility, you guys, when you're eating the right amount of protein and when you're eating whole foods, your energy, is yep. really good like you notice it on your energy you notice it on your weight you notice it on your skin like there's just so many other things so mm -hmm. that's um super super important and i think something again that you mentioned briefly is kind of like that nutrient density we're eating a lot of like empty foods yes you know like the easy foods are majority empty foods so when you're trying to look for mm -hmm. food like pro focusing on those instead of like asking like how many calories this has like is this going to nourish me right is yep. this going to make me spike is this going to make me nourish so those are very actionable things. I know when you're going on a fertility journey, it feels like you don't have control over anything, or at least that's how I felt. I felt kind of like my odds were in like somebody else's hands because mm -hmm. I didn't have the right tools in the beginning and the right knowledge. And I felt like it was up to chance, right? Well, it was up to chance. It was up to a certain medicine that I had to take. But in this conversation, you guys have heard, like there's so many things that are in our, like in our control. So I feel like doing some of these things, it's actually also really good for that. And mm -hmm. I wanted to get into this question that I saw coming through the question box, since we're talking about nutrition. 
which is does fasting affect fertility? There is like this huge mm -hmm. tendency for like intermediate fasting. Yeah. Majority of the studies, I was mind blown one time when I was like getting a little bit more into it. And it was like, well, all these studies are like made in men, right? There's very few mm -hmm. studies that focus on women. So here we are, all of us like, yep. taking all of this advice, but yep. men and women are different. So yes. how does that affect us? Like, and um, is there any impact in our fertility mm -hmm. if we're doing like long periods of fasting? Yeah, I love this question so much. And because I had really wanted to touch on the men, you know, that's one of the biggest frustrations and the biggest points of teaching for me with my clients is I'm going to look at both partners because all of the onus is always put on the female partner. And hey, your partner's contributing 50% of the DNA and his DNA is actually what um, creates the placenta. And his DNA is what's going to program your baby's metabolism for their long lifelong health. So if he know. is, yes, isn't that insane? And insane. there's not like, so if he is you know eating a lot of highly processed food and he is overweight and there's all that going on then that is actually going to have an impact on baby's metabolic health that's going to like impact them for the rest of their life it programs them epigenetically so very important that partner is doing this alongside you um and yes all the fasting studies are done we're starting to get a little bit in women with PCOS, um, but most of them are done in men. Men's biology is so different than ours. So their hormones reset every 24 hours because their dominant hormone is testosterone. Testosterone follows that circadian rhythm just like cortisol. So in the morning, testosterone rises like cortisol, it decreases throughout the day, resets the next day. Everything in our society is, is following that circadian rhythm and that, that male structure. Our hormones are different. It takes about 28, 29, 30 days for us to go through our hor whole hormonal cascade. So for us, fasting, we've got to be super careful careful with. I tend to like fasting in the first half of cycle, meaning like maybe right after you stop bleeding during that follicular phase, right after you stop bleeding up until ovulation. If you want to play with some longer fasted windows, do that and see how you feel. For me, after ovulation, my energy tends to go down quite a bit. And that's when I'm really focusing on like honing in on my protein because that's when you'll crave carbs. You'll notice you'll crave a lot more carbs mm -hmm. after ovulation because your body is trying to get ready for potentially supporting a pregnancy. But we also tend to have some insulin resistance around that time. It's super interesting. Um, so that's my advice. I also, I think you're wearing an aura ring, right? Yes. Yeah. So aura ring, whoop, any of those kind of devices can actually help guide this for you. So I would see like what's happening with my recovery and my my nervous system during my cycle and then what happens when I play with fasting. Fasting may be more appropriate if you've got some um, insulin resistance, especially that's really not responding super well to your dietary changes. Fasting might be a great option, um, but there's also a lot of different ways to play with that. I think I like to have women who are not breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. um, play with like the fasting from like, you know, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Like you're supposed to fast all night long. That's really doable. Yeah, yeah, that's doable that you're supposed to fast all night long. It's just when we, um, you know, we have dinner and then we, ha we watch TV and we have in our popcorn and, you know, whatever snack and snacking one that disrupts our sleep because now our body is focused on digestion instead of repair and healing. Um, and so that can really mess with hormones. So I would rather everybody just focus on like that 12 hour fast at night. And then if you want to extend it a little bit, that's fine. But what I've actually found can be um, better is that if you try to stop eating earlier in the day, so eat a good solid breakfast and then stop eating at like 4 p.m. and do your fasting on that side because that's better for your circadian rhythm. What I see is that women get up, they have coffee with oat milk, which is now sending your blood sugar through the roof and has broken your fast. Um, and then they don't eat until lunch. And then they wonder why they feel like crap and they have no energy and their hormones are all out of whack. Um, I see that super commonly. So co black coffee with MCT oil does not break your fast, but I would rather you have a good solid breakfast, get your face out in the sun, do all that, and then like stop eating earlier in the day and see if you can shift things that direction. And I find that to be more effective and more supportive of your hormones. That's what I personally did. And that actually helped really well. I also, I feel like in our society and maybe like I'm speaking sometimes about myself and my experience, but uh, I see it frequently with my friends too. We're scared of eating as women, right? We're like, oh, we're yeah. scared of eating enough. Yes, yes. So one of the things that we are used to, it's like, oh, like have your coffee for breakfast. And I, but for me, I can truly say it, it changed 100% how I feel yeah. just by having a high protein breakfast, like making sure that I'm hitting 
30 grams of protein in my breakfast, mm -hmm. it makes me feel good. It doesn't make me feel sleepy and it makes me feel satiated until my lunch. Like yeah. I don't feel like I need to eat my dog by 11, you know, like I feel calm. I don't, yeah. I, it's another sensation, you know? So I feel like that is, mm -hmm. that is a really, really, really good point. And with fasting, I think like you said, it's something super important too, of like being individualized, but we want kind of like a cookie cutter recipe for everything we do. But that's why talking to someone like you, it's just so, so important. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, yeah. And I think also just remembering that you, there's not going to be like a, the, the way you're supposed to eat for the rest of your life for every single season. We are cyclical, especially being women. We are cyclical beings. We are meant to be a little bit different from season to season. And so you're not going to find like the perfect way of eating and, and that's going to be it. And it's going to keep you at the exact same weight and all the things are going to be amazing for the rest of your life. It's going to change and learning how to listen to your body and flow through that change is like the most incredible gift. Perfect. Wait, let's talk because we've taken so much of your time. I want to touch on like one important point. I saw a question that I deleted by accident. So sorry to whoever <laughs> like put that question. I put it on the question box and I put the X instead of like the bring it up. But she was mentioning that she's getting ready for an egg retrieval. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that we can do to improve the quality mm -hmm. of our eggs? Like, yeah. and I, like, maybe this is the opportunity to talk a little bit about vitamins and like micronutrients. But yeah. is it in our capability to improve the quality of our eggs? Question yeah. number one, and then Ab how can absolutely. we do it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, generally I work with a lot of women who are in various stages. Some mm -hmm. of them um, are totally preconception, haven't even tried, just want to get a solid foundation. Some of them are at the point where we're going to fertility treatments. But again, as you've mentioned, like, just the fertility treatments alone were, were basically forcing the body to do something that it didn't necessarily want to do on its own. Like we still have to come alongside with all of the lifestyle stuff if we really yes. want to support a healthy pregnancy, right? So I generally like everybody to be on a really good, solid prenatal vitamin. I feel like that is an insurance policy to, to get in all of those little micronutrients that we need. And, you know, the thing that I see very often that, um, that women are low in, and this is, this is pretty consistent amongst the studies, vitamin A, vitamin D, a lot of the fat soluble vitamins, mm -hmm. because we were um, made to be very afraid of vitamin yeah. A. So all the controversy about vitamin A tends to be about the supplement specifically, not what we're getting in animal products. It's very mm -hmm. hard to like get too much vitamin A if you're getting it in the whole food form. But what happens with the supplements is a lot of it is the um, the plant-based form. Yes. And so it's not actually very absorbable to our cells. Vitamin A is really important both for egg quality, sperm health, and then if there is a direct correlation with healthy pregnancies and vitamin A consumption. So yeah. vitamin A is super important. Make sure that you have the retinol form in your prenatal vitamin as well as the pro-vitamin. Um, Definitely vitamin D has been shown to decrease the yeah. risk of miscarriage. It's even shown to decrease preterm birth. It's so important for immune function. It actually helps to um, prevent the body a little bit from seeing the baby as like a foreign invader. It kind of modulates your immune system in that way. So your body's more accepting of the, the embryo. Um, folate, so the activated B vitamin, super important, B12, folate, not folic acid, um, super, super important. And we have to remember that if you've been on a birth control pill, many of these nutrients are depleted. And so you yeah. need to be re replacing them. And I can't, I can't ever, I don't think I've been able to ever name a patient who was told, oh, make sure you're taking a prenatal vitamin while Nobody you're on your birth control. That. Nobody talks Nobody. about that. So now we're telling women, oh yeah, just come off your pre or your birth control and go ahead and try to get pregnant. But they're so depleted mm -hmm. of these key nutrients that are very important for sustaining a healthy pregnancy. And that's magnesium. That's your B vitamins, um, vitamin E, you know, so we really have to make sure that we're replacing those for a solid three months before trying to get pregnant so that those nutrients are on board from the moment of conception because you need them. You really need them. Um, and then also, you know, those will help. A lot of the, um, the micronutrients are also powerful antioxidants. So like selenium, um, iodine, like those things really help to support egg quality. So, you know, you can do things like um, coenzyme Q10. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can do things like extra selenium. But generally, I think if you do a really good quality prenatal vitamin and, um, and really focus on that, you're going to get a lot of the things that your body needs while also making sure that you're eating a whole food diet and getting lots of healthy fat and all of that. 
I think you mentioned something that is key and I'm very, very passionate about. Like people think that we don't need to replete nutrients just because like maybe you're eating well or like mm -hmm. why would you need like after like, but just knowing that the stress we live right now, like for example, magnesium, like that affects a lot your magnesium, right? So just making sure that you're repleting just because of the lifestyle we live, it's also, I, I am just on board like you, like super important to eat whole foods. Like it's amazing, but it's really hard to get the optimal amount of vitamins that you need just yeah. through yeah. food. So yeah. even if like taking a vitamin, like you said it so correctly, it's your insurance policy to making sure that you're getting at least the amount at least, the like, minimum at the least, minimum yeah the minimum yeah. that you need of those vitamins so it is your insurance policy and yes. you said another point that i think is critical that for all of you guys that are here and that will listen later it's about the right form of the vitamin and i'll give you a quick example again of what happened to me um my fertility story like we're not going to talk about it right now but i kept losing babies like that was mm -hmm. my thing right and i remember the ob told me like um, my mom was there. She's Mexican. She was very angry. She has a very strong temper. And the doctor told me, like, Lorena, we're going to wait until you lose four to do more studies, right? And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm already going crazy with two. Like, I don't think I can mentally sustain four. No. So I went and looked for help. Well, you guys, I was taking a multivitamin, but I was taking a multivitamin with folic acid. I tend mm -hmm. to be one of those people that has NTHFR, yep. two copies mm -hmm. of that gene. Mm -hmm. So I cannot process folic acid, right? So I needed methylated folate. Yep. And that's why so a simple thing as that, as the right form of a vitamin, I could not sustain a healthy pregnancy because I was completely depleted of folic acid but i needed yeah. it in its active form yeah. so it's not just about getting a prenatal vitamin it's about getting a prenatal vitamin with those vitamins and the forms that you need because it's critical like it's really important like for some people it might make like me a bigger difference than others but you need to make sure that you're taking your prenatal and um mm -hmm. making sure that you have the right sources for that, yes. those vitamins. And, and if you don't, so I have a lot of skeptical, because I have the people, oh, well, I read that multivitamins, you just pee them out and they're not important. No. Okay, well, let's check your vitamin levels. We can very mm -hmm. easily check B12 folate. I like to check magnesium. I check vitamin D. Like those are like the basic ones that I'll check. If you want to do a full micronutrient panel, we can do that too. Um, but the basic ones, everybody's always low in b12 everybody's always low in ma magnesium for sure yes. um so i i do that so i can show them like what their levels are and then we can kind of supplement accordingly but i think just as like a general statement yes like being on a good prenatal vitamin is important um I did see a question about like picking a prenatal. I think looking for the activated form of the B, so methyl B12, methyl folate, looking for one that has choline in it because choline yeah. is another one that's similar to B vitamins, super important for the neural tube development. Folic acid gets our folate, gets all the attention in that regard, but choline is very important. Making sure it's third party tested for any heavy metals and pesticides mm -hmm. and all this because supplements are not regulated. Um, those are kind of my like go-to steps when looking for a good quality uh, prenatal vitamin i agree and tanya as far as like prenatals like us we focus on the postnatal part on breastfeeding so when you're breastfeeding like come and get our powders like they're the best i think mm -hmm. but um i think for prenatals like look for a company that truly has had like thorn is a really good company for prenatal vitamins uh, designs for health has some really good prenatal vitamins um they use really good forms of their ingredients so if you're looking mm -hmm. for a brand those are some that you could actually use but um yes uh, Britt, this has been one of my favorite lives and because we've given so much actionable information like i think in this topic it's about like feeling a little bit of like it's in your control like so it that is. was my goal i'm like let's have a conversation yeah. that can let you feel that there are things you can do yeah and things that can actually move the needle right so yes. this has been so incredible how can people work with you like if somebody listening right now or later is like hey, like I, I need some help with this. I don't even know where to start to know if yeah. I have insulin resistance. Am I low in vitamins or not? I already have my OB, but I need to work with someone alongside that. Do you work virtually just in person? How can people get in contact with you? Yeah, I actually work virtually um, for the majority of my clients because I have women that reach out to me um, from across the country. So I love being able to do that. You can just, I'm really active on Instagram, right? In my profile, mm -hmm. I've got a link where you can fill out um, just a little questionnaire and we can talk about how we can work together. And then I also have um, programs for if like the one-on-one -on -one thing doesn't feel right for you right now. I've got several programs that you can DIY 
DIY and do along with mm -hmm. your partner to like really help set that solid foundation or come alongside you as you're working through any of the fertility treatments um, with, you know, another provider, you know, totally do that. And, and I just want to say like, I really yeah. believe that my purpose on this planet is to help women feel empowered to really be the stewards of their own health care and navigate this journey for themselves and really feel in control and like you can have the experts that come alongside mm -hmm. you but ultimately you're the one who is is taking healing of your body in into your own hands totally i totally agree well Britt, like i said this was one of my favorite lives you guys if you didn't catch it from the beginning there's so much actionable information so much that we discussed but thank you so much for your time, Britt. I cannot wait to send the email about this. And thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have a great day. Bye, Britt. Bye.